As I stood in the bustling streets of Seoul recently, I couldn't help but be struck by the dynamism and innovation on display all around me. South Korea has undergone an economic revolution in recent decades, transforming itself from an impoverished, war-torn nation into an export powerhouse and technological leader. And the economic plans recently unveiled by the government show that this spirit of reinvention is alive and well. At the core of Seoul's strategy is a recognition that the old drivers of growth, heavy industries like shipbuilding and automobiles, are no longer enough to sustain an advanced economy. Instead, the focus has shifted to cultivating the industries of the future, from semiconductors and green energy to entertainment and military technology. It's an audacious pivot that will require not just financial resources, but a continued outpouring of human ingenuity. The centerpiece is a pledge to dedicate over $6 billion in low-interest loans to companies at the cutting edge of semiconductors, batteries, biotechnology, and other advanced fields. Make no mistake, this is about more than just propping up domestic champions. It's an acknowledgement that whoever wins the race for technological supremacy will own the commanding heights of the 21st century global economy. You could see the intensity of that competition during my visit to the massive Samsung semiconductor plant in Weizong. There, in what seemed like a city unto itself, row after row of workers in bunny suits labored in supersanitary fabs to etch ever more microscopic circuits onto silicon wafers. South Korea may lack many natural resources, but it is blessed with a deep pool of human capital, the raw material for innovation. The country has emerged as the global leader in memory chips, while also making huge strides in logic chips for applications like artificial intelligence and automotive systems. With future technologies like quantum computing on the horizon, the government clearly recognizes that continued semiconductor leadership could be a wellspring of economic strength for decades to come. But semiconductors are just one part of a broader high-tech push. The administration of President Yoon suk Yeol is also betting big on industries like biotechnology, setting up a $2.3 billion fund to support medical research and production of treatments for diseases like cancer and dementia. During a visit to the gleaming new biomanufacturing campus of Samsung Biologics in Incheon, I was amazed by the scale and complexity of the operation. In vast bioreactor tanks, part of a $2 billion investment, Genetically engineered cells were cultivated to produce vital protein-based drugs like antibody treatments for cancer and autoimmune diseases. The facility is on the cutting edge of the burgeoning field of biosimilars, near replicas of original biologic medicines that hold the promise of making such treatments more affordable and accessible worldwide. South Korea has leaned hard into this space, with its homegrown pharma giants like Samsung Biologics and Celtrion now among the top producers globally. We used to have to go abroad if we wanted to access the latest biotech, but now with our growth in this industry, some of the most innovative treatments are being produced right here, a lead researcher told me. It's an apt metaphor for the country's technological coming of age across multiple fronts. Speaking of innovations born in South Korea, no discussion would be complete without mentioning the stratospheric rise of K-pop and the broader Korean cultural wave that has captivated millions worldwide. Few could have predicted this soft power phenomenon when the first K-pop idols began to find regional success in the early 2000s. But today, names like BTS, Blackpink and New Jeans are global superstars, playing to packed stadiums and racking up billions of streams and video views. The frenzy surrounding their music, choreography, fashion and personalities has arguably made them the most recognizable cultural export from South Korea since Samsung smartphones. So it's only logical that the government would look to double down by creating a nearly $3 billion fund to further nurture this juggernaut of an entertainment industry. The aim is to provide financing for concerts, album production, content creation, and expansion into new markets like the Middle East. When I attended a K-pop dance practice at one of Seoul's premier entertainment academies, I saw firsthand the incredible discipline, work ethic, and ambition driving these young would-be stars. Many had relocated from smaller towns, living in dorms and training upwards of 12 hours, a day to master not just singing and choreography but languages and other performance skills. We're well aware that for every group that makes it, there are hundreds more who don't, one student named Jimin told me. But we're ready to do whatever it takes because being a K-pop star is a chance to show the world just how talented we are. That perseverance in pursuit of dreams embodies the same spirit that helped power South Korea's economic ascent over the past half-century. And while K-pop may seem a world apart from semiconductors or biotech, they are all now intertwined threads in the nation's ambitious high-value export strategy for the coming decades. Indeed, 
a visitor could draw a straight line from the high-tech research hubs to the K-pop practice studios to the advanced arms factories, all serving as wellsprings of innovation and key generators of overseas sales and influence. South Korea remains heavily dependent on international trade, so nurturing a diverse array of globally competitive export industries is fundamental to its economic roadmap. And when it comes to arming itself, both for national defense and to tap into the lucrative global weapons market, South Korea is taking a major leap forward. Part of the new budget proposal includes a 2% increase in military spending on advanced systems like drones, missile interceptors, and next-generation jets. At Korean Air's aerospace division in Sakhon, I got an up-close look at the prototypes for the country's first indigenously produced fighter aircraft. With stealth capabilities and other advanced features, the sleek KF-21 is intended to supplement and ultimately replace the aging fleets of F-15 and F-16 jets imported from the U.S. South Korea has traditionally been a major importer of military hardware, but by channeling its technological prowess into defense industries, it aims to reduce reliance on foreign suppliers while also cracking open new revenue streams in the $100 billion-plus global arms export market. We're ready to take our place as a leader in aerospace and other strategic industries, an official told me. Just as we've done with cars, ships, and electronics, we can design, engineer, and manufacture world-class weapons systems right here. It's an apt aspiration for a nation that came into being scarred by war and the constant threat from the nuclear-armed regime in Pyongyang just 35 miles up the road. Ensuring its security while also expanding its strategic economic interests will require a steady allocation of resources matched by continued leaps in domestic defense innovation. Indeed, across all these cutting-edge realms, what stands out is South Korea's insistence on self-driven development rather than just riding on the coattails of others' technologies. Having ascended from poverty to the economic ranks of the developed world through relentless education, hard work, and calculated risk-taking, there seems to be a national mentality that, if we can put a man on the moon, we can solve any technological challenge. Yet even as South Korea boldly embraces its high-tech future, the society is grappling with serious demographic headwinds that could jeopardize long-term growth and dynamism if left unaddressed. With a fertility rate of just 0.78 births per woman, the lowest in the world, the nation faces an impending crisis of rapid aging and depopulation. Part of the new budget aims to tackle this issue head-on by ramping up financial incentives for childbirth and parenting. Monthly child care allowances would rise sharply under the plan, while mortgage regulations would be relaxed for parents having a baby. There would also be a major expansion of the parental leave policy. Raising the ceiling on the time parents can take off work after childbirth incentives aim squarely at boosting a fertility rate that lags even chronically low rates in places like Japan or Italy. When I visited the leafy upscale neighborhood of Gangnam to speak with young professionals, I heard the same off-sided reasons behind the demographic drought. Skyrocketing child-rearing costs, limited space in cramped high-rise apartments, career disruptions for working mothers, and a lingering culture that still leans heavily on wives to shoulder the household burdens. Having a baby nowadays seems like a luxury only the truly wealthy can afford, at least if you want to provide everything for them. One woman named Yuna told me over coffee. We already work such insane hours, so taking time off is a real sacrifice. And even if we do have kids, the education rat race starts practically from birth just to get them into a good university down the road. It feels like an endless cycle of stress. Such sentiments capture the immense societal pressures underlying the baby drought. And while generous government subsidies may help on the economic front, truly rebooting birth rates will likely require a more profound shift in cultural attitudes about work-life balance, gender roles within marriage, and the institutional burdens surrounding parenthood. During a visit to a daycare center in Seoul's Maypo district, I saw just how intense the juggling act is for working parents. There, children as young as one or two were engaged in a dizzying array of enrichment activities, from math and reading drills to music and foreign language lessons, designed to give them a crucial head start in South Korea's hyper-competitive education system. We start them early here because that's what it takes to get into the top elementary schools, which feed into the right middle schools, high schools, and universities. One teacher told me matter-of-factly, the system is set up to be this way, so we do what it takes. For parents muddling through 12-hour workdays before the grueling school slash hagwon, cram academy, marathon in the evening, it's enough to make one's head spin, which helps explain why despite the new government incentives aimed at childbirth, 
South Korea's fertility rate actually fell even lower over the past year to set a new record low. Reversing such demographic realities won't be easy, but it's encouraging that President Yoon has made it a top priority by pledging to establish a new cabinet-level ministry dedicated to boosting birth rates. His government clearly recognizes that without a steady influx of new human capital to replenish the workforce and fuel growth, South Korea's economic ambitions could ultimately be stunted. There are already signs of strain from rapid aging and disappearing youth population across businesses and industries. In conversations with small business owners and farmers across the country, many complained about woeful labor shortages and an inability to find younger staff as birth rates have contracted. At the massive Garrick Agriculture Market in Seoul, I saw stall after stall initially built to be staffed by multi-generational families now struggling to stay afloat with only a few aging employees left. One owner in her 70s told me all of her children had opted for city career paths, leaving none to take over when she's gone. Our way of life could disappear if these trends continue, she fretted. Farms like these used to be handed down for generations, but there's no one left. Similar existential anxieties pervade other sectors too, from manufacturing to construction to restaurants. A surplus of jobs and a shortage of hands willing to take on grueling, low-wage work it's an imbalance that spotlights the unsustainability of South Korea's current demographic trajectory, and one that mass immigration alone likely cannot resolve. After all, having an ultra-low birth rate while remaining one of the world's most ethnically homogenous societies gives the nation minimal running room on this critical issue compared to more diverse economies that can rely on a steady influx of immigrants to restock young working-age populations. But even as it braces for perhaps its greatest socio-economic challenge in the coming decades, South Korea seems determined not to let the demographic time bomb derail its bold agenda to stay at the vanguard of the industries and ideas that will shape the world's future. Semiconductors, biotech, entertainment, aerospace. These are the pillars around which the country's economic strategy is now constructed. And to safeguard its ability to capitalize on these booming export industries while plowing new ground in areas like AI, quantum computing, and advanced materials, the South Korean government is lavishing resources across the board. Billions for basic research and development. Generous tax incentives for frontier technologies. Heavy investment in STEM education and technical training pipelines to mint a steady flow of science and engineering talent. During a stop at the sprawling new campus of the Institute for Basic Science in the city of Taejeon, I got a first-hand look at the country's commitment to fundamental scientific exploration. There, Teams of researchers are working at the frontiers of fields like quantum science, brain-computer interfaces, and nanomaterials, basic investigations that could someday enable revolutionary new technologies. We have to keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible, the director of the Institute's Quantum Computing Center told me as we toured the facility's ultra-cool quantum lab space. Only by exploring the deepest mysteries of the universe can we find those paradigm-shifting breakthroughs. It's heady ambition to be sure, but one backed by serious investment and national commitment. South Korea already ranks among the world's top spenders on R&D as a percentage of GDP. And with a renewed focus on cultivating cross-disciplinary expertise and peaceful risk-taking, the country seems determined to keep stoking its innovation furnace. That mindset was also on full display at the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST, arguably the nation's most prestigious tech university. There, I met with student researchers pioneering work in areas like nanomaterials for energy storage, artificial intelligence for healthcare, and robotics to assist an aging population. Our generation understands that South Korea must keep reinventing itself economically and technologically in order to maintain our standing in the world, PhD candidate Hyun Soo Kim told me over coffee at the sleek Seoul campus. The biggest risk is not taking risks when it comes to exploring new frontiers. Such confidence and drive seems emblematic of the ethos that has propelled South Korea from poverty and defeat in the Korean War to the economic powerhouse it is today. Even as it confronts the demographic storm clouds on the horizon, there is a sense that this is merely another challenge to be surmounted through grit, ingenuity, and national resolve. After all, this was a country that had to rebuild itself from the ashes of war and despair just a few generations ago. The same perseverant spirit that overcame those trials now propels it ahead into vanguards like green energy, bioengineering, and next-generation digital realms. At a sprawling Samsung renewable energy campus in Chungcheongbuk-do, I got an up-close look at the country's drive to be a leader in areas like high-efficiency solar cells, 
grid scale battery storage, and hydrogen technologies. Row after row of factories and R&D centers hummed with activity aimed at advancing these critical clean power sources. The future is about more than just making chips and smartphones. It's about securing new forms of energy to power that future sustainably. An executive told me as we surveyed a field studded with solar tracking arrays. And we intend to be out front on all of the core technologies that will make it possible. That same ethos carries over to cutting-edge digital domains that could reshape everything from finance and healthcare to urban planning and entertainment. South Korean companies and researchers have quickly established themselves as pioneers in areas like 5G wireless, cloud computing, fintech, and artificial intelligence. At the Samsung AI Center in Seoul, scientists are working to advance machine learning capabilities for applications as varied as digital healthcare assistance, smart manufacturing, and autonomous robotics. The ultimate goal, to make South Korea a global AI powerhouse on par with the US and China. For a country of our size, we have no choice but to be among the first movers in revolutionary technologies like AI, the center's director told me. Artificial intelligence will be a bedrock of most major industries in the decades ahead. So our economy's future success depends heavily on seizing early leadership. The nation has moved out smartly on this front graduating a cadre of top AI engineers and researchers while positioning domestic titans like Samsung, Naver, and NCSoft as major investors in the field. It recently unveiled a national AI strategy aimed at becoming one of the top four AI powers globally by 2030. But beyond its corporate and economic implications, there is also a cultural dimension to South Korea's AI ambitions, a desire voiced by many I spoke with to make an indelible societal contribution to this world-altering domain. We have such a rich artistic and storytelling heritage. Wouldn't it be incredible if South Korea could help shape the very realm where human creativity and machine intelligence intersect? Mused a Yonsei University student over drinks in Seoul's vibrant Hongdae district. That would be a source of immense national pride. Such aspirations are not idle chatter. Indeed, the nexus of technology, entertainment, and cultural influence increasingly lies at the heart of South Korea's global brand and economic strategy. For even as it bets big on semiconductors and green energy, the country's leadership clearly recognizes the value and potential of its booming content industries, which helps explain the new $2.9 billion fund dedicated to sustaining the explosive growth of the Korean entertainment wave, from K-pop music and television to video games, esports, and webtoons, by providing financing for concerts, album production, creators, and marketing overseas. Seoul hopes to solidify its cultural dynamism as a key asset and export. We're passionate about our culture and want to share it with the world, but we also know that in the modern era, that culture is an enormously powerful economic force. A senior presidential aide told me when I raised the initiative, why wouldn't we nurture an industry that is opening so many doors for our companies and soft power globally? The runaway success of K-pop alone exemplifies this influence. Since the early 2010s, Acts like BTS, Blackpink, and Tomorrow X together have harnessed a potent blend of musical talent, stylized personal branding, and savvy social media marketing to build powerhouse global fan bases and record smashing album slash ticket sales. In many ways, it's the perfect encapsulation of the Korean economic model in the content era start with top flight vocalists, dancers, and producers. Add a heavy dose of aspirational personality cult and high concept visual identity then leverage digital connectivity to cultivate an immersive fan universe that consumes every piece of content and merchandise. Its showbiz ingenuity meets manufacturing precision, and during a visit to the K-pop powerhouse SM Entertainment's headquarters, I saw the full scale of the star-making machinery up close. From massive practice studios and recording facilities to dedicated sets for music videos, promotional shoots, and live-streamed fan events, the entire K-pop industrial complex was on display. Personal branding camps, Intensive dance and language study, filming for reality shows and diaries, SM's trainees are put through a veritable star academy before they're even considered for debut. It's as rigorous a process as the semiconductor fabs and biotech labs I toured, with a constant churn of aspirants hoping for that big break. They call it the K-pop training system, for a reason. An SM producer told me as we observed the latest class of potential idols being drilled relentlessly. The companies take raw talent and both refine and package it according to their formula for success. And what wild success it's been. Even amid the recent decades-long boom in Korean films, television dramas, and pop culture exports, 
the stratospheric rise of K-pop remains the standout phenomenon. It sparked a fierce loyalty among hundreds of millions of fans worldwide that consumes every album, merchandise item, and social media post from their bias idols at a ferocious rate. BTS in particular has reached almost unparalleled global popularity, setting records in music sales and online viewership while becoming trailblazers in areas like concert touring and social media marketing. Their power was on vivid display one evening during my visit, when the release of their latest anthology album essentially froze internet connectivity across major parts of Seoul. It was yet another sign of the seismic shifts being driven by South Korea's most improbable, yet most influential new economic driver. For all the investment and fanfare surrounding semiconductors and biotech, the content wave has been rapidly reshaping the world's perceptions of Korea, from a former economic upstart to a bona fide cultural superpower. And the economic tailwinds stemming from that newfound cachet seem to grow by the day. Barely a week went by without spotting some Korean product integration or advertising tied to a K-pop idol, hit TV show, or major movie release. It was as if the entire nation had become one massive marketing vehicle for its multitude of export industries. A synergy between culture and commerce that generated palpable excitement and economic momentum. Things have changed so rapidly, it's still hard to fully comprehend the magnitude sometimes. Remarked Taejin, a manager at one of Seoul's signature Korean barbecue restaurants packed with visitors from around the world. Just a couple decades ago, people outside of Asia barely knew anything about us. Now our music, Shows, movies, food, it's everywhere you look. From the trend-setting neighborhoods of Hongdae and Itiwan to the immaculate high-rise corridors of Gangnam, there was an unmistakable sense of national pride and ambition rippling through the citizenry. South Korea finally appeared to be enjoying its long-awaited cultural moment on the global stage after decades of economic success. It was a stark contrast to the existential doubts that seemed to linger there not so long ago. Having lifted itself out of poverty through sheer grit and strategic industrial policies, the country spent much of the late 20th century anxiously working to cement its standing among the world's leading economies. There was always a nagging sense that its miraculous rise could be impermanent without constant vigilance, that hubris or complacency could jeopardize its precarious perch in sectors like autos, shipbuilding, and electronics. National self-confidence seemed perpetually fragile the memories of war and deprivation lingering close. But something profound shifted as a new millennium dawned. With its multinationals now household names and its economic credentials firmly established, South Korea seemed to cast off some of those lingering insecurities. A vibrant youth culture blossomed, distinct from the conformist pressures of the past. The focus expanded from just exports and GDP to cultivating a unique global identity through its artists, entertainers, and digitally connected creative class. You could see that new ethos spreading through trendy neighborhoods like Hongdae, where I wandered amid bustling streets packed with indie music clubs, artisan craft shops, and buzzing cafes. Music of all genres spilled out of the venues, while street art and ad campaigns showcased the latest Korean fashion and media juggernauts. It was as if the district had become an incubator for the country's new content nation brand, a seamless integration of next wave media, consumer trends, and Korea's growing cultural resonance worldwide. From the underground rapper collectives to the graphic novelists and Instagram influencers, the creative sparks that fuel the entire entertainment economic engine seem to be flying here. This neighborhood has become the ultimate intersection of inspiration and impact, a veteran music producer told me over drinks at a breezy outdoor bar. The kids soaking up these vibes today could very well create the next global K-pop sensation or streaming hit tomorrow. That sense of youthful dynamism and exploration felt distinct from South Korea's past economic development models, which often prized hierarchy, deference to authority, and grueling sacrifice in pursuit of materialistic goals. While those Confucian values still hold importance, they seem to quietly cede ground to a more expressive and individualistic ethos among the millennials and Gen Z driving the cultural wave. You could see the transition playing out in the country's signature exports. Where South Korea was once globally renowned for technically impressive yet largely impersonal electronics like TVs and smartphones, it now traded heavily in emotion-driven content that enabled deep audience connections with its films, music, celebrities, and fictional narratives. Fandom had become an economic force unto itself. Our dramas and K-pop acts may be highly stylized, but what resonates so powerfully is that they tap into very human stories and experiences a professor of communications at Korea University explained to me. There's an aspirational quality, 
but also an honesty in how they explore relationships, social pressures, emotions. It's art imitating life, imitating art. Whereas South Korea's initial industrial policies centered on churning out cost-competitive household goods, hardware, and components, the content economy required an entirely different creative skill set. One predicated on developing intellectual property, honing cultural nuances, and forging transcendent emotional bonds with global audiences. It was a transition that seemed to draw heavily from the country's deep folkloric storytelling traditions, even as it embraced cutting-edge technologies for production and distribution. At the sole headquarters of HYBE, the entertainment juggernaut behind K-pop titans like BTS, I gained insights into how that melding has powered their success. From story camps that gather writers to brainstorm narrative concepts for future albums and music videos, to state-of-the-art visual effects and motion capture studios, the company has built a vertically integrated system to craft every last detail of their idols' performative journeys and personas. We're world builders here, creating deeply immersive alternate universes that artists and fans can inhabit together across every possible content medium, a HYB executive explained as we toured the company's glistening new exhibition space. It's Disney and Marvel for a new era. That same fusion of tradition and innovation could be seen across Seoul's buzzing media production corridors. At the headquarters of entertainment giants like CJENM and Studio Dragon, I encountered teams of writers, directors, and technicians working to breathe life into the next blockbuster film franchise or hit streaming series. Using cutting-edge virtual set technologies that enabled real-time pre-visualization, they could seamlessly blend live actors and dazzling digital environments on a grand scale. It was the classic Korean technical mastery now being applied to unlock new realms of cinematic expression and storytelling. We have one foot grounded in our rich narrative heritage of myths and historical dramas, while the other is planted in these futuristic tools that let us transcend reality, remarked Kim Yong-won, an award-winning director and producer at Studio Dragon. That's an enormously powerful creative intersection to occupy. The sophistication of their methods matched the growing global appetite for South Korean stories and cultural exports. Once relegated to niche art house releases, Korean films and shows were now pulling in blockbuster viewership across streaming platforms like Netflix. Series like Squid Game, Extraordinary Attorney Woo, and The Glory had become bona fide crossover hits that captured mainstream attention spans around the world. There have certainly been other cultural phenomena like martial arts movies or Japanese anime that have enjoyed periods of global popularity, noted Michael Kirpan, a professor of Korean cinema at Yale University, when I visited his New Haven office. But in terms of overall depth and breadth of impact across so many narrative mediums and genres simultaneously, from romance dramas and zombie thrillers to superhero spectacles, the Korean cultural wave is really unprecedented. He attributed the resonance to several factors, the increasing technical excellence allowing sophisticated visuals, the emotional authenticity of the character-driven storytelling, and a keenly universal exploration of social themes like class divides or the alienation of modern life. But perhaps most importantly, he said, was South Korea itself. There's this amazing duality that the content seems to capture. On one hand, it conveys very Korean contexts, cultural motifs, and societal anxieties. But there's also an evergreen relatability to the core narratives about family, identity, ambition, and human striving that feels accessible to everyone, Professor Kirpan explained. It's both hyper-specific yet broadly universal at the same time. That globalizing appeal had turned South Korean media into one of the world's most impactful cultural exports alongside giants like Hollywood and the BBC. And just as the British or American entertainment industries propelled the influence of those societies through the 20th century, many saw Korea's content wave as punching above its weight in shaping global perceptions. It's a sort of soft power that money can't buy, the professor continued. When billions of people have become emotionally invested in your country's stories and celebrities, it builds an incredible reservoir of goodwill that can open all sorts of doors, economic, diplomatic, you name it. The phenomenon was already being capitalized upon by major Korean companies seeking to ride the coattails of the cultural momentum. Everywhere you looked, brands were engaging in product integrations, celebrity endorsements, and other marketing hooks tied to the latest K-pop releases or streaming sensations. At one of Seoul's sprawling Samsung showrooms, I encountered life-size displays of BTS photo shoots and music videos completely intermingled with advertisements for the company's smartphone and home appliance lineups. 
it was immersive branding striking straight at the hearts of the group's global fandom. K-pop may have seemed like just entertainment at first, but it's proven to be an unbelievably powerful vehicle for marketing our technology around the world, remarked a Samsung executive leading my tour. The passion of those fandoms is really something to behold and well worth tapping into. Korean automakers like Hyundai and Kia had also recognized the phenomenon's potential, launching campaigns to tie their latest models to celebrities and characters from buzzworthy new shows and movies. Giant LED billboard displays across soul-blended cars seamlessly into scenes from massively popular dramas like The Glory. Even the country's arms manufacturers had taken notice. With one display, I encountered marketing guided munitions alongside footage from popular military shows and games, making a none-too-subtle appeal to young demographics around the world. It was stark evidence that South Korea's content industries had transcended pure entertainment to become powerful economic amplifiers in their own right. A new cornerstone of the national brand that could propel growth across technology, consumer goods, and even strategic industries for years to come. Many cities around the world have tried to emulate the Hollywood model by developing their own film production hubs and studio facilities. But few have managed to replicate the self-reinforcing cycle of success where content begets influence which begets more content hits. Perhaps only India's Bollywood entertainment mecca has rivaled the sheer scale of the Korean content economy's ascendance. And even by Bollywood's standard, the Korean wave punched above its weight given it emanated from a small geographic footprint with limited population and existing cultural resonance in many markets. It was a true underdog story of national branding that continues to confound skeptics and rewrite conventional wisdom. Our biggest advantages may have simply been hunger, adaptability, and killer instincts for what works, remarked Minji Kim, a fiercely ambitious up-and-coming actress who walked me through the trainee regimens at one of Seoul's elite talent academies. Just look at how we even branded our English name as K-pop, rather than the more generic Korean pop. We were determined to make it a distinctive world product. That appetite for creative disruption and market dominance seemed ingrained in the cultural DNA driving the entire ecosystem. Korean entertainment juggernauts like CJENM, HYBE, and Studio Dragon were always strategizing about the next frontier to conquer, whether it was virtual reality storytelling, building Marvel-esque media franchises, or tailoring content for emerging markets like the Middle East and Latin America. We can't afford to be complacent for even a moment. The CEO of one major studio told me over lunch at a stylish restaurant in Seoul's Gangnam district. The competition is too intense and our home market too small to just rest on our laurels. Every year we have to be augmenting our offerings with something new and compelling that builds our global brand. It was a savvy acknowledgement that South Korea's cultural exports, for all their astonishing mainstream success, still occupied a relatively niche space compared to Hollywood's dominance. The big entertainment conglomerates seemed determined not just to capture more market share, but to keep evolving the very art form itself through technical and creative innovation. One studio I visited was experimenting with integrating AI story writing into their project development pipelines. Another was working to develop photoreal digital influencer avatars that could be strategically deployed across entertainment and brand marketing channels. Eventually, the line between our real and virtual worlds will blur completely, a producer told me. We want to chart that course rather than be disrupted by the next big paradigm shift. It spoke to South Korea's greater ambition of establishing a permanent beachhead as one of the cultural capitals and creative engines of the 21st century. Not just an exporter riding whatever wave happened to crest, but a definitive agenda-setting force shaping the future of media itself. And it was clear from my travels that the roots of this cultural dynamism ran far deeper than just the big studios or K-pop music factories in Seoul. In many ways, it stemmed from an entire societal reorientation around creativity and individualistic pursuits that would have seemed unthinkable a few decades prior. In bohemian enclaves, co-working spaces and art academies across the capital, I encountered an entire ecosystem of creatives and digital entrepreneurs working to cultivate the next big thing. Whether it was webtoon illustrators, indie musicians or graphic designers, there was a palpable energy and sense of possibility in the air. Neighborhoods like Hongdae and Yanomdong thrummed with unconventional grit and style. Their streets lined with vintage markets, music clubs, and artisan cafes. Graffiti-splashed alleys and impromptu busking performers gave the districts an air of urban vitality that felt a world apart from the buttoned-up corporate precincts elsewhere. But dig deeper, and you'd find many of those coffee shops or live music haunts doubling as gathering spots for young people furiously brainstorming new creative projects.
storytellers workshopping movie scripts over pour-over brews, aspiring YouTubers plotting their next viral video gambit, underground rappers passing around rhyme notebooks between set breaks. This place is just overflowing lately with big dreamers trying to make it big in entertainment, art, fashion, you name it. A local musician and influencer named Hyunjin told me over drinks one evening in Hongdae. She ran a popular YouTube channel showcasing indie Korean artists and streetwear brands. The energy definitely comes with plenty of struggle and competition. But that's kind of the point. This is where you test your creative metal and hunger against everyone else trying to do the same thing. It was invigorating to see that gritty hustle existing alongside the ultra-modern K-pop training campuses and billion-dollar studio hits. A reminder that South Korea's ascent as a cultural and creative dynamo had been powered in equal measure by elite star-making machinery and grassroots artistic risk-taking. Because for every highly calculated project from the entertainment giants, there always seemed to be a counterweight of boundary-pushing outliers doing their part to keep the cultural ecosystem vibrant and innovative. Take the case of MLBJ, an unconventional hip-hop crew I encountered during one of my nights exploring the indie music scene in Seoul's grittier Itaewon district. Performing a blistering set that blended Korean lyricism with experimental electronic influences, the foursome radiated a raw, almost punk-like energy that felt distinct from K-pop's tightly choreographed spectacle. We call ourselves Ugly Rap because we're the intentional opposite of the Pretty Idol style. Loy, the group's animated frontwoman, explained after their set amid a cramped, smoke-filled club. Our mission is to reflect the uglier realities of life through our music, to be provocative and hit hard on social issues. From gender inequality and domestic violence to capitalist alienation and racism, MLBJ's abrasive lyrics pulled no punches in confronting modern Korean society's darker underbellies. It resonated with the young, restless crowd who rapped along fervently and motioned to the rhythmic barrage. A lot of these kids don't see themselves reflected at all in the escapist fantasies of K-pop, Loy said. We give them a mirror to society's ugliness even as the mainstream tries to swept it under the rug. In that sense, MLBJ and the underground musicians follow a long tradition of provocative Korean artists throughout history, using their craft to confront power and hypocrisy even in the face of censorship or backlash. It lent an edgier, more subversive undertone to Seoul's creative renaissance that seemed to counterbalance the more commercial imperatives of its entertainment titans. But at the same time, the boundaries between mainstream and avant-garde in South Korean culture appeared to be blurring as never before. Indie acts like MLBJ had amassed major global followings and streams through services like YouTube and Bandcamp. Webtoon artists had parlayed their cult followings into major studio deals. Social media allowed subcultures to rapidly amplify themselves into cultural forces on par with corporate hitmakers. The internet really leveled the playing field for us, remarked Yun Ji, the webtoon artist behind the breakout hit Icicles, which was being developed into an animated feature film. We spoke over tea in her colorful, plant-filled studio apartment that doubled as her creative workspace. People might initially stumble on your work randomly while doom-scrolling on their phones. But if it strikes a real emotional chord or taps into the cultural zeitgeist in some way, it can just go supernova from there. Indeed, South Korea had capitalized on this empowering democratization of content creation and distribution like few others. The country's blistering internet speeds, high-tech infrastructure, and younger generations' digital nativism made it fertile ground for creative passion projects to rapidly metastasize into global phenomenons. Zombie thriller hashtag alive, for instance, had gone from a cult webtoon into a Netflix smash garnering over 70 million streams. Online fantasy-slash-romance novels were being adapted into buzzworthy dramas and films on an annual basis. Edgy hip-hop crews like MLBJ racked up millions of YouTube views simply by being provocative and catchy at the right cultural moment. In the old system, they'd have smothered our kind of music before it could ever reach an audience, said Loy of the group after their set. The internet set us free to go directly to the people without any middlemen policing the art. It was clear, after immersing myself in Seoul's thriving subcultures, that South Korea's creative revolution extended far beyond the glitz of the K-pop factories or studio blockbusters. For every carefully calculated move by a major entertainment company, there was an equal and opposite underground energy propelling innovation in unexpected directions. Even in the country's seeming mainstream hallmarks like K-dramas, webtoons, or esports, 
One could detect continual creative ferment bubbling beneath the surface as upstarts sought to push stylistic boundaries or inject stories that channeled some larger social truth.